Welcome back to Making the Case, everyone. Cell phone video showing three white police officers sicking a police dog on a black man in the small town of Woodson Terrace in St. Louis County, Missouri, is drawing outrage online. Local police say they were responding to a 911 call about a man trespassing at a business last Monday. But when they tried to place the man under arrest, he ran into traffic. Now, in the video, the man appears to be experiencing a mental health crisis. And then the video shows the police repeatedly sicking the dog onto him, letting it bite him for prolonged periods of time while he screams for help. Now, we're going to show a portion of that video for you right now, but we've got to warn you, it is difficult to watch. And we reached out to the Woodson Terrace Police Department, but they did not return our request for comment. In other media statements, the department defended their officer's use of the dog. The incident is now under investigation by the FBI and St. Louis County prosecutors. For many African Americans, the Missouri video conjured up brutal and painful images of police dogs attacking black people throughout history, from slavery through the civil rights movement and present day. Now, as one local newspaper, the Post-Dispatch, put it, Bull Connor would sure be proud to see his legacy live on. To discuss this case, we're joined now by Dr. Marsha Chatland. She's a professor of history and African-American studies at Georgetown University and the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. Welcome to Making the Case, Marsha. Uh, I want to talk about this video that we just showed. We didn't show the whole thing. It, it's horrific. We showed just a part of it there. Uh, I know you saw some of it. What do you think after watching that video? Well, I think that this video illustrates many of the reasons why people are really pushing for us to rethink the framework of policing. In a situation like this, where this person may be having a mental health incident, or the person may um, be intoxicated in some way, there are many ways that we can diffuse these situations that don't require using an animal as a weapon. And I think that video like this really does where raise awareness about the limits of some of the interventions we thought would reduce this type of behavior, like body cameras, which weren't on those police officers, but we have footage. You know, there's all sorts of calls for defunding and dismantling the police because of incidents like that, that really do call into question whether or not this person is better served by having this animal attack. Yeah, and like I said, we didn't show the entire video. It's just too graphic and too much to show. But the man was apparently suffering from a mental health crisis. He was being arrested for trespassing, nothing serious. Why do you think police would think it was appropriate to use a police dog in this circumstances? They could have called an ambulance. They could have called for some other type of help, but they, they used dogs. Well, I think that it points to the fact that we know that there is no federal standard for police training. There's no set protocol for this type of engagement. It's police um, uh, precinct by police precinct. It's, you know, city by city. And so as a result, there are no kind of set expectations about what's too far. And I think that we know historically and we know from so much of the research that when an African-American suspect is involved in these types of engagement, there's a greater possibility, a greater chance of violence being considered the first step rather than the last resort. Now, Marsha, you know, most people are familiar with images from the civil rights movement of police dogs being sicked on black protesters. But the use of dogs as a tool of racial terror actually dates back to the slave patrols. How does that history relate now to current day policing? Well, one of the things that scholars have uncovered was that certain dogs were actually bred to be in pursuit of enslaved people and to uh, brutalize them. And so while we think of shackles as representative of the inhumanity of the system of slavery, the use of dogs in the pursuit of people who had run away and sought freedom as well as a disciplinary tool, um, that has its deep origins in the ways that African Americans are policed and also um, trained to be afraid of dogs. I think that this image, you know, really shows us the great lengths that police go to to um, terrorize and to victimize people before any understanding of what's happening.
Yeah, and using dogs to do that. Now, by the time police were sicking dogs on peaceful protesters in Birmingham, Alabama, the German Shepherd had become the quintessential police dog. I want to explain how race plays into the German Shepherd becoming the attack dog of choice for police departments. Well, some of it is about a socializing of certain breeds of dogs for attack, and also the visual of the size of the dog and the um, demeanor of the dog automatically puts people on a defensive. And, you know, those images from the civil rights era really does raise awareness about the great risk people took to ask for things like equal rights under the law to try to end police brutality, to try to have the right to vote respected. And so these animals were very much an extension of the way that the state was explaining that black lives did not matter and that they would use any type of force if necessary in order to tell people to sit down and not stand up for their rights. And you know, Marcia, the thing is, you know, in popular culture, police dogs, they're actually portrayed as heroic much like police officers. And I think people imagine police dogs mostly working, like sniffing out drugs. You know, they don't think about this sort of brutality. Is there a way of changing that? Well, I think that this is interesting because there was a very big effort in the 1960s to reform the image of police. And this is where we get projects like police officers in schools, officer friendly, and later um, leagues like uh, DARE and other programs that were supposed to normalize relationships with the police among young people. But I think that this idea that policing is inherently heroic, that when bad things happen, it's about one bad apple, really does obscure the origins of police practices and the way that we have these disparities that continue to show up in our social media feeds. And so I think that there's some really interesting work that happens where popular culture tries to normalize police presence. And you know, a dog sniffing out drugs can mean a number of things uh, in terms of communities that are often surveilled because of drug use and the communities that are not. And so I think we have to be really cautious about accepting these images as just true and um, not really problematizing what they're trying to communicate. Yeah, if somebody's having a mental health crisis, you don't sick dogs on them. You call for an ambulance, you call for help. But so much more to talk about there. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsha Chatlin, Professor of History and African American Studies at Georgetown and Pulitzer Prize winning author. We appreciate you joining us tonight on Making the Case.